Both verbs also mean to raise and upright. There was no other kind of resurrection. He uses that verb to argue for the historicity of the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15. Well, what does the verb use over in Matthew 27? It's Gary. They were raised. 1 Corinthians 15, 4 to him, that's historical. Passive sense, same verb. Mark 16, 6, that's historical. But Matthew 27, 52, even though it's the same verb, he says, indicates physicality, not historical. Why is that, Dr. Craig? You can see Dr. Craig is not treating equally declarative statements the same. He was raised on the third day according to scriptures in 1 Corinthians 15.4. That's historical. Mark 16.6, he was raised. Oh, that's historical. Matthew 27.52, many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Not historical. And it gets worse for him because he makes another issue of the use of the word soma, body. He says 1 Corinthians 15 must mean physical because of this word soma. And he quotes Gundry saying, Gundry succeeds admirably in carrying his main point that soma is never used in the New Testament to denote the whole person in isolation from his physical body. But it is much more used to denote the physical body itself or the man with special emphasis on the physical body. What do you have in Matthew 27? Many bodies, somata. The very word, he says, indicates physicality. It's in Matthew 27, but not in 15.4 of 1 Corinthians, the one he wants you to take physical. Why is that, Dr. Craig? Well, what makes that story in Matthew 27 an uh, non-historical? Well, apocalyptic embellishment, he tells us. Well, what does that mean? How does embellishment differ from additional historical detail. Is he a priori also excluding historical whatever has an apocalyptic context? Because, you know, you could also say all of Mark is in an apocalyptic context. Why don't you just take then Mark 16 figuratively, just like you did in Matthew 27? Because you said it was because of apocalyptic embellishment. Go read Mark 13 and see how much apocalyptic embellishment there is. So yes, Dr. Craig, there are two of you. You're a supernaturalist when it comes to the stories you favor, a naturalist when it comes to the stories you don't favor. Now, let me get to another thing I said I was going to do, and to show that what he calls facts sometimes are not, that he invents facts. He tells us that James, the brother of Jesus, was killed. And he uses that as evidence that since he was a disbeliever before, now he must be a believer. He must have seen something. And he quotes Josephus. He says, we learn from Josephus that James was eventually martyred for his faith in Jesus Christ during a lapse in the civil government of the mid-60s. Is that what Josephus said? That's not what Josephus said when I read him. This is what Josephus actually said. It says, Ananus the high priest at that point, thought he had favorable opportunity. And so he convened the judges of the Sanhedrin and brought before them a man named James, the brother of Jesus, who was called the Christ, and certain others. He accused them of having transgressed the law and delivered them up to be stoned. Nothing there about dying for faith in Jesus. He says it was his brother. He didn't die for his brother. He didn't say anything of the kind. He just proves how easy it is to invent traditions. Now he has Josephus saying something he didn't. See how traditions grow? <clears throat> but it's going to get worse for him because he still does not explain how he gets from the third century when the first documents we have of the resurrection over to the first. But he tells us how he does it. <clears throat> he says that the phrase on the first day of the week is the key. And he says, the fact that Mark uses on the first day of the week that phrase confirms that his tradition is very old, even antedating the third day reckoning. This fact is confirmed by the linguistic character of the phrase in question. For although the first day of the week is very awkward in Greek, when translated back into Aramaic, it's perfectly smooth and normal. 
This suggests that the empty tomb tradition reaches all the way back to the original language spoken by the disciples. Well, I've taught Aramaic. I've taken Aramaic dialectology, and I was traumatized by that statement. So, Dr. Craig, you wanted specifics. You told me that that phrase confirms that you can get back to the disciples' time. And you said that when translated back into Aramaic, that phrase, the first day of the week, is perfectly smooth and normal. So I have a couple of questions for you. One, what would on the first day of the week be in perfectly smooth and normal Aramaic, Dr. Craig? And two, what specific Aramaic text did you consult in order to make that translation? 